I'm this gonna conference will this conference just... will now be recorded. Okay, there we go. I am going to record this presentation so that folks who weren't able to attend tonight can watch it, but also those of you who might want to review it uh, from year to year or later this season, if you see something and you'd like to take a look at it, uh, you can just uh, review this video. And then uh, also I will be sending to Cindy the PDF of my slide deck so that you guys will have all of the labeled photos of everything I'm gonna show you. So it'll sort of be like a personal pictorial for you for Pine River Pond. So it's a, a good little resource for you to have. So starting off, let's see, all right. So yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a slide lag. Um, so in the presentation, what I'm gonna do is focus on a few things. Um, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna talk about native aquatic plants that you do have in Pine River Pond. And the, the thing with those is to learn what they are and then just kind of ignore them, like set a little filter so that you can then just look for things that are new or different or that aren't supposed to be there. And that will help you key in on any invasives that are new or just coming in. Um, the second thing I'm going to do is show you some photos of algae that are good and bad. I know you guys have had some problems with cyanobacteria in recent years, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what's okay and what's not okay and what we should know about. Then I'm going to show you two sets of invasives. One is invasive aquatic plants and then the other is invasive aquatic animals. Just so you have some photos of those things that are nearby to you and also on the move in state and regionally as well. Because literally a lot of these invasives are just a boat ride away. It just take somebody coming from another lake to introduce any of these things into a new water body. So a bit about uh, big picture, the state of the state, if you will. We have a number of water bodies across New Hampshire that have different types of invasive species. This is the current map of infestations in the state, and every dot is at least one type of infestation. So we have right now 91 infested water bodies, but we have about 120 infestations. So what that means is even though we have 91 water bodies that have something, the number of infestations adds up because some water bodies have more than one thing. A couple of them have two or three things. And then we have a couple of water bodies like the Connecticut River and the Nasher River down south that have six different invasive things in them competing for space. So some water bodies have it rougher than others. Uh, but this is the laundry list of different types of things that we have in our water bodies. Variable milfoil is by far the most prevalent uh, statewide. And you can see all the little red dots indicating variable milfoil growth. Uh, I was actually just serving Ossipee today, surveying their milfoil. So that's not too far away from you guys. Um, so that is definitely high on the list of worrisome species for you is variable milfoil. Some of the other ones um, aren't as much of a problem. Eurasian water milfoil and fanwort are probably low priorities for you guys just because they're not geographically near you and the water chemistry in Pine River Pond really wouldn't support those so well. Uh, a couple other ones like water naiad could potentially grow in Pine River Pond. It is south of you by maybe 10 miles down in Milton, so it is a risk. And then uh, another one, which I don't have listed here because we don't have it in New Hampshire, is hydrilla. And that's probably 20 miles from you guys as the, as the crow flies over in Pickerel Pond in Limerick, Maine. So you have a couple threats coming in from Maine as well. And then there are some animals that I'll highlight as well to be aware of. So I know many of you have served as weed watchers for some time. Some of you are very new to this. Um, I thank you for your efforts and the extra eyeballs that are on the water. It really does take a lot of people keeping an eye out for things. Uh, and this is gonna sound very daunting to all of you who are new because finding a plant in a whole lake sounds impossible, but I can give you a great example from a lake right near you. Um, a uh, Great East Pond in Wakefield 
has found one stem of variable milfoil by weed watchers. So it can be done. Uh, it was quickly removed from the lake and it didn't spread. So that is definitely a success story. Uh, they were not botanists, they were not scientists, they just were out looking for something new or different that shouldn't be there, and they identified it, so it, it works well. Uh, so weed watching is a very proactive approach to help protect your water body, and the earlier we can find things, the better we can respond to them and hopefully eradicate them. If infestations get too big, we don't even use the word eradicate anymore. We talk more about long-term management. To be a weed watcher, you don't need a lot of things. Uh, basically something to get out on the water with. And it could be some type of vessel like a canoe or kayak, a motorboat, a paddle board is really popular these days. Or you could simply put on a mask and snorkel or or lay down on a swimmy float and paddle your way out and look in the water, um, whatever gets you out there. Uh, and when you're out there, it's a good idea to have a lake outline map with, with past plant identifications, and I'll share some of that with you. Also a good idea to have something like a long handled rake so that if you do see something that you can collect a voucher specimen and turn it in to me so that I can identify it. Uh, with that, you should probably have some Ziploc bags just to put specimens in. And one of the most important tools that I use is uh, a fairly cheap one. It's polarized sunglasses. They really help cut the surface glare on the water so you can see down in a lot better, especially on sunny days like this uh, or previously sunny days like this. Um, so I tend to think that the brown lenses of polarized sunglasses help better maybe because our lakes are slightly brown or tinged, but uh, the, the cheap $10 pair from the, from the nearby drugstore will suffice. You don't need really high-end ones, uh, but those are really helpful when you're out weed watching. When you're on the water doing weed watching, I, I believe you guys have Pine River Pond broken up into shoreline sections where people volunteer for uh, a section here or there. If not, I recommend breaking up the lake uh, into pieces. Like if, for example, I don't think you can see my cursor, but these black lines show uh, one end of a section to another. And that could be assigned out to an individual. The next one down could be. And that just helps share the burden uh, of all the different areas to look at. And while you're out there, doing your weed watching. And by the way, I recommend weed watching once a month from May through September. That's the prime growing season. You wanna scan the surface of the water and look for any pieces that are drifting around. A lot of times when you have an invasive, you have these little scrappy pieces of plants that are floating around. That could be an indication that something is rooted somewhere. And then also scan the bottom for plants that are rooted and growing up through the water column. Uh, I recommend doing a zigzag motion. So start at one end of your section and zigzag back and forth to the other end of your section so that you can cover as much area as possible. For you guys, I'm gonna say that depths out to about 10 feet are about where you should be headed from shore out to 10 feet and back. So that would be about the, the most common depth for any any of the plants to be growing. Um, and then while you're out there, uh, I recommend looking uh, on days that tend to be sunnier and calmer. <laughs> Finding a calm day these days is kind of hard. Everything, every day seems to be a little windy. But if you can find a bit of calm with the sun high in the sky, that's really helpful for seeing deeper into the water column, especially in slightly tea colored water. And then you can alternate between doing horizontal patterns to back and forth zigzag from shore out to deeper water. Um, the goal is just to cover as much surface area in your zone as possible. And what are you looking for? Well, anything that's new, different, out of place, you didn't see it last week, last month, it's growing more than it was last year, um, anything like that. And that could account for a lot of stuff. <laughs> Some years we have banner bladderwort ears, which is a native plant. Uh, so 
whenever you're in doubt, the good thing to do is send me some photographs of what you're seeing and I can identify those for you. Um, a lot of the invasive plants that are, in, that are of concern grow fast. Um, milfoil can grow an inch a day. The hydrilla that I mentioned that's over in Maine can grow six inches a day, which sounds really fast, but uh, it is really fast. So you'll see it, it'll, it'll creep in pretty quickly. Uh, and then animals like mussels or clams that could be in really high number on the bottom. Now, of course, in sandy areas, you might have a lot of the native elliptia mussels. So they're those big oval mussels, those, those are native. We're not worried about those, but when I show you some of the pictures of the invasive animals, those are things to look for. If you find something, we'll definitely need a voucher specimen, but you should also try to keep track of where you were so that if I need to go and try to find it, or you wanna go back to that site, you can do it. A lot of people use marker buoys. Um, a lot of really easy techniques include cutting up one of those long, colorful swimmy noodles into pieces and put a rope through that and then just use a small weight. I use a couple of um, washers or something, heavy washers or something like that. That way you can put the rope right around it, toss that in and it will unroll as it sinks to the bottom and that marker stays in place on the top. If you are more of a techie person, you can use a handheld GPS unit or a GPS app on your cell phone to get coordinates or take a waypoint that you can share with me later. You can triangulate from three points on shore or flag the shoreline or just take some general notes about where you were. So anything to get back into that general area. So the voucher specimen, this is important because uh, I, I have myself and a half a biologist in the exotic species program. And like I said, we have 91 water bodies that we're responsible for. So all of the other ones that we know don't have anything uh, or don't think have anything, we like to triage. So having that voucher specimen is really useful. So I can just look at my cell phone from an email and say, yes or no, it's good, bad, or I'm gonna be there right away. Uh, so that's helpful. If you're collecting a plant or an animal, just collect a piece of it in case it is something that's rare, that we do occasionally have rare plants and animals in our lakes. Put it on a piece of white paper or a white paper towel and put a coin or a ruler or something for scale on there and then take a picture of it. And then you can just send that to me by email and I will let you know what it is. Um, I check email regularly. And that pretty much summarizes that. My email is here. You'll also have it later. And Cindy definitely knows how to get a hold of me for, ident for identifications. So moving on, we're going to take a look first at your aquatic plants. So these are the plants that we know are in Pine River Pond. And they're the ones that you should be on the lookout for uh, to learn and then ignore, <laughs> just so that you can set a filter for those. Uh, these two maps that I'm going to show you are a little fuzzy, but I'm going to tell you where to access these yourself. So this is a depth map of Pine River Pond, and you guys have a lot of deep areas up the middle, but there are lots of coves, as you all know, that are fairly shallow. So over on the northwestern shoreline and even up towards the northern shoreline, uh, all those areas that are less than 10 feet deep are prime for plant growth. Uh, so you would probably have a mix of things in those zones. And then we also have a historic plant map on record. And this is showing you symbols that correspond to this key that I've provided here. So you have an idea of what is where. Um, note that the milfoil that you guys have that's native is not on here because at the time that we did this survey, it wasn't present. But I do believe that Solitude Lake Management did a survey for you guys a few years ago, so you should have a current map from them. And for those of you who would like to get clear images or downloadable images of the plant map and depth map that I just showed you, this little online tool is helpful. So you can, uh, <laughs> you can type out this whole URL or you can just do um, DES Lake Mapper and 
just type out this right here, DES Lake Mapper, and that will get you to this map. And once you reach this map, if you zoom in and click on a lake or river, as in this case, you'll get this little dialog box that pops up. It will tell you what invasives we know are in the system, but then you can click on different reports, management plans, lake assessment reports. And if you do this little drop down or maximize this, you'll see all kinds of reports um, and the lake assessment reports have the plant map and the depth map in them and whatever other data we have for Pine River Pond um, or any other lake nearby that you want to explore. So that tool is available to you. So let's take a look at some of the plants. And again, remember, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly so I don't keep you guys overly long, but uh, this will be this is recorded and you will have these slides shared with you so you can review them. So when you're talking about aquatic plants, I want you guys to think about standing on your shoreline and looking out over the lake. And when you look down at your feet when you're standing on shore, you're gonna see plants that are rooted in the mud or sand or whatever your substrate type is, and they're coming up above the surface of the water. Those are the emergent plants. As you wade out a little bit deeper, knee deep, maybe hip deep, you start getting into the floating leaved plant zone, um, like your, your typical lilies. And then as you move out deeper, you start getting those underwater plants that are mixed in. And I'm gonna talk about the plants broken down into categories like that starting first with the floating leaved plants. So we only had two that were listed. There are chances are that you have more uh, uh, different other species. There are only a few species of floaters. This is yellow water lily. This is usually the one that's up first in the growing season. Uh, it has these big oval leaves with a heart-shaped base. And then of course, it's a dead giveaway when the yellow water lily comes up or the flower comes up. And then we have the white water lily. If you look at these, if you guys are fans of the throwback Pac-Man game, uh, the leaves look like Pac-Man. They're circles with this big V-knot shape in them and the white flower. So those are both native, very common, uh, good, good for the water body. They provide shade to the water column and help cool the water underneath so that it's not baking in the sun um, during the hot summer days. So the emergent plants that I mentioned that are rooted in the, sub the substrate and have plants above the sediment or above the water surface, there are a few of these. The first one is arrowhead. This usually grows in a cluster like you see here. And the leaves look like arrows or big letter A's. So they're this is a very typical growth habit. And then in about a month or so, you should see little white flowers that come up from these. Cattails, I think everybody knows those. Those are very familiar. These are really good for holding the near shore area together. And cattails are excellent filters. They filter a lot of sediment and nutrients and metals out of the water column. So whatever runs off land and goes through cattails inevitably gets cleaned up quite a bit. And then burr reed, this one looks like cattail over on the right, except it's a little more stunted. Uh, it only grows about a foot tall or so. Uh, and then we also have an aquatic form over on the left where it's more ribbon-like leaves that lay flat on the surface of the pond. And then both forms have these little white flowers and then these little green burr-like seed heads. That's why it's called burr reed. Uh, pipewort, this is an indicator of good water quality. So it's a good one to have in your lake. I like to call this one the astroturf of lakes because it looks like uh, turf. It's got these little spiky green carpets that are a couple inches tall. And then from the little cluster of leaves, you have this stalk with this little white button-like flower. This looks like it's really short. Um, in this example, it is. It's probably six inches tall, but I've also seen pipework get three feet tall or four feet tall in deeper water. So don't be surprised if you see that. Spike rush, this one looks like um, pipewort, except it has brown little seed heads instead of little white flowers on the tip. 
very similar growth habit. Pickerel weed, this one is close to shore. It's probably one of our more colorful flowers around the lake edge. And uh, a lot of people might confuse this with purple loosestrife, but a little tip on this one, with the pickerel weed, which is native, you have a stalk with the flower, and then you have a stalk with a leaf on it. And the leaves look like donkey ears. I'll talk about purple loosestrife in a couple of minutes. That's the invasive, but the pickerel weed's totally normal and native. And then you guys also have this neat little plant. It's called smartweed. You might see this along the roadways a lot, but there is an aquatic form. The aquatic tends to have uh, pinkish flowers on it. That one probably should have been in the floating category, but it, it does sometimes form an emergent growth form. And now we're moving a little bit deeper underwater to the submergent plant zone. So this is the tricky one. This gets a lot of people, including me. It looks a lot like milfoil, except when you look at it, uh, the leaves of milfoils are all feather-like. Uh, and while these look like feathers, it's more of a branching or a split pattern where one leaf comes out and it splits into little divisions. Uh, and then the dead giveaway with bladderwort is these little seed-like growths. These are actually bellies. It's a carnivore and all of these bellies will eat the microscopic organisms that are in your water column and digest them for extra nutrients. Um, it will also photosynthesize, but it does have these little bellies that help supplement nutrients. This is your native milfoil. I think a lot of you who spend any time in the shallows might see this. Um, this milfoil in particular grows five or six feet tall. It is very big. Most of our native milfoils only grow a foot or so tall. So this one is a bit of an anomaly. Um, I've noticed that other lakes along the eastern border of New Hampshire tend to have this plant. And it is not a harmful plant, but it is a big grower. Um, so like I said, the milfoils have leaves that look like feathers. And you can see that well here. Um, and they're slightly staggered or sometimes whirled around the main stem. Uh, they've got little flower stalks that come up above the water. And then they also um, have these little tag along tails almost uh, little, uh, they're called winter buds, but they're like little tassels of leaves that cluster around to the offshoot of the stem. So those are some characteristics to look at for those. And then pond weeds, we have a lot of pond weeds in New Hampshire and most lakes have three or four different species. Some have floating leaves like this one and some underwater leaves as you can see in the backdrop. Some of them look like big feather fronds and these are down close to the, to the bottom and they never really come up beyond just over the bottom. Some of them have crisp little lettuce-like lettuce -like leaves that clasp the main stem like clasping leaf pond weed. And then some of them are also giant like bassweed. This one grows five or six feet tall, uh, fairly large, and it has these big brown curly leaves. And then it also has some green floating leaves on it as well. So that was it for your natives. There may be some other species in there. So if you encounter anything that I didn't list, feel free to send me a photo and I can add it to your slide deck and we can um, expand as we need to. So just a couple of photos of algae. And we, <laughs> I, the last two days that I was out on water bodies, I've found cyanobacteria blooms already, once in, one in Ossipi and then one in a southern pond. So cyanobacteria are starting to grow, so it's worth keeping an eye out for them. I know you guys have had some up in the water column and you've also had some matting on the bottom. Sorry, I'm battling with my dog for mouse control. <laughs> he keeps nudging me. Uh, so this one, as uh, relatively unsightly as it might be, is totally safe. This one is filamentous green algae. 
and it almost looks like clouds or cotton candy on the lake bottom and it's usually an emerald green color now this will die off over the season and it will turn kind of a, a gunky brown color um, that's a natural process so this this stuff is typically okay the stuff that we worry about though is the scums or some of the the benthic matting material so if you ever see anything like this um, please let amanda mcquade in our office know um, Cindy knows how to get a hold of her. You can also reach out to me and I can put you in touch with um, Amanda as well. But cyanobacteria are something that we, we do really worry about and want to know about and we'll do a positive ID on it and determine if it's in high enough density that we want to list the water body as um, a watch and try to restrict swimming, especially of pets and small children because they are very susceptible to the toxins that this cyanobacteria can produce. All right, so we're gonna move into the invasive plants now. And these are really the ones to hone in on in terms of early detection. So everything that I've shown you up until this point is all native. We're gonna transition into the invasive plants first and then the invasive animals. And again, uh, my contact information is in a few locations in this slideshow, so you can reach out if you want to triage anything. Um, I need to get rid of the little footer down here. Sorry, I used this slide in another presentation. Um, so variable milfoil, like I said, this one is the one that was all the red dots across New Hampshire. And uh, it looks like a bottle brush or little Christmas trees or <laughs> one of my volunteers calls these squirrels tails and uh, you can see that here. So these are very thick growths along the main stem. It's a milfoil so the leaves are feather like and you can see in the upper right they're nicely whirled around the main stem. The number of leaves in a whirl is going to vary. It's why it's called variable milfoil. It's different every time you see it, but it typically has a thick stem, either reddish or greenish, and very tightly packed leaf whorls. Uh, the other one is Eurasian water milfoil. You have one site uh, in Brookfield, which is sort of near you. It's close to Lake Wentworth and Wolfboro, nearby there. Uh, where this plant is located. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil is a lot like variable milfoil, except when you look at it, you can see that there's definite spacing between the whorls of leaves. It's not as squirrel tail like. And uh, in the upper right here, you can see the little tag line uh, that shows if you count these little pairs of leaflets along a stem, I'm sorry, along a leaf, there will be 12 or more. So that is dif a distinctive of the Eurasian water milfoil. So bigger gaps between the whorls of leaves and 12 or more leaflets in a, in, in, on a leaf. So that, that's one that I don't think will be a big problem for Pine River, but it's a good one to know about because it's not that far from you. I'm just going to flash through fan wart. This one is not very likely for you guys. This is really along the southern border of the state. And it is one that we only have in nine water bodies right now. The leaves are opposite. And they're not feather like like you would see uh, on the milfoils. They're more of a branching pattern. And because of that, this could very easily be confused with um, the bladder wart that I mentioned. But of course, note there are no little black bellies or green bellies on this one. Uh, okay, so hydrilla. This one is the one that I mentioned in it, that's near you in Pickerel Pond in Limerick, Maine. So this is coming at you from the east. And they have that population fairly well under control over there but it does receive a fair amount of boat traffic and the Wakefield lakes are not that far away from them. So it's a good one to be aware of. We do have a native plant that looks a lot like this. It's called waterweed and waterweed has leaves that are in whorls of three. 
And if you look down the stem of the hydrilla, there are many of them that are four or more leaves in a whorl, and that's distinctive. And you can also see that they have teeth on the edges of the leaves, so that's also distinctive. So if it's three leaves or less, don't worry. If it's four leaves or more, definitely let me know. And sometimes those, those teeth can be hard to tell, so go by leaf whorl count uh, as, a, as a good indicator. And uh, actually this plant itself is from Pickerel Pond in Limerick, Maine. And it looks a little scrawny. This piece is actually only about six inches tall, but this plant can grow 25 feet tall. So if you think about the areas of Pine River Pond that have you know, 20 feet or less of water, that could be bottom to surface growth and then matting on the surface. So it could be quite problematic. And another similar one, Brazilian Elodea. This looks a lot like the Hydrilla, except it really doesn't have any teeth on it. This one usually has leaves that are in whorls of five. So again, four or more leaves in a whorl is something that we should know about. And just a close up of that one, you can see up in the upper right, the leaves in whorls of five. Water chestnut is one uh, that's a floater. Um, you can see that it doesn't look anything like the white water lily or the yellow water lily that I showed you. It has these little triangular shaped leaves that are uh, in a rosette of leaves and it is anchored to the bottom, so it's rooted. And this is the root system coming down on the bottom left from that rosette. This plant, is one that could potentially become a problem in more water bodies. Right now it's only in the Nashua River and in the Connecticut River, and it's not in Maine yet, but the seed right here can stick into the breast feathers of birds and it can be moved that way. So if you do have a lot of waterfowl visiting the lake, this one could potentially be a problem. And then as Cindy said from the beginning, there is a plant nearby you that is a big concern because there was suddenly 40 plus acres of this in the Milton Three Ponds, specifically uh, Northeast Pond in Milton. And it just manifested. We, it was not there and then all of a sudden it was there covering 40 acres. So this is a fairly low grower, so it's not going to be up through the water column like the hydrilla that I mentioned. The, the leaves are needle-like and they have little teeth on them. You can kind of see that in that orange inset photo. And the leaves recurve, so if you look in the upper left, you can see those leaves are bent backwards. Um, so that's, those are some defining characteristics. Uh, this plant's also called brittle naiad. And that's a good name for it because it's very brittle and it spreads apart. And the thing with this one is it's not the leaves or the stems that are going to spread it. It is a prolific seed producer and it will start to spread by seed. So every piece of plant that breaks off, if it has seeds attached, it's going to spread around your lake uh, and then those seeds will drop and grow. And uh, this one usually starts out when the water is really warm. So we start to see this one growing when the water is 70 degrees or greater. And that's usually second, third week of July, depending on the spring that we have. And you will start to see these little plants emerge. Of course, we have two natives that look a lot like this. So um, it, it is worth taking a specimen and looking at it closely and also sending me some photos just to double check it, just so that we know if it's the invasive or the native. So that is water naiad. And then uh, just a couple more emergent ones. Um, like I mentioned when I was talking about pickerel weed, purple loosestrife is a, an invasive. It can, the, uh, the purple loosestrife is the invasive, pickerel weed's the native. And if you look at this one, like I said with the native pickerel weed, the, there was a flower stalk and then a single stem that looked like a donkey ear leaf attached to it. Uh, this one, the invasive, has leaves that are opposite or whorled, 
and they are also um, on stems that are square. So they're four-sided. So very distinctive characteristics there. You're gonna see this one growing on your shoreline areas, uh, not in the lake. It doesn't like to have wet feet. But the thing with this one is you wanna catch it early because they can produce up to two and a half million seeds that are about the size of pepper grains. So they spread very quickly because of that, both through wind and water. And then common reed or Phragmites. This one you might start to see creeping in um, for any of the bigger roads around the lake. If you have any road salting done, this one likes to go along the, the roadside ditches and it likes salty soils. So it could creep over and come on into your lake um, by culvert. So it will send runners or seed stalks through culverts and then come right down into the lake and it will grow in the lake as well so on land and in the lake um, really tall plant several feet tall it will have these big sword like leaves and then later in the season it will have these brown seed heads that form uh, and then i'm just going to move into a few animals that you would like to be aware of in case they do show up uh, the Asian clam is uh, one that we do have in a handful of water bodies in the state. They are only um, from about Bow, New Hampshire south. So they haven't gone north of that yet, but any lakes that have sandy bottom areas, these would do really well. So um, they'd be quite happy. So they're about the size of a dime or sometimes a quarter for the more mature ones. You can see a, a range of sizes from the juveniles up to the adults here. And the thing with these is that they are small. They're much smaller than any native mussel or anything that we have. Um, the distinguishing characteristic isn't the color because they can be brown to tannish, but it's these ridges. These are really pronounced ridges on the shell. So if you were to run your fingertip or your fingernail over those ridges, it's almost, it's almost ridge like a potato chip. So they're very obvious. Um, so uh, these, there are some places in New Hampshire where these are uh, at 99 to 100% cover across the bottom of a lake so and river. So they do get quite numerous. And the thing with these two is that they are hermaphrodites. They have both male parts and female parts in the same shell. So if you were to have one that was introduced, it would just take one. And then you could have a whole population starting from just that one. Uh, the, these will most likely be spread by larvae coming in from visiting boaters. And those uh, larvae will form the adult muscles and then you'll have reproduction from there. The Chinese mystery snail, these are in dozens of water bodies across the state, unfortunately, and they're quite large. Uh, you can see here they're next to you, one of them's next to a quarter, but if you want a 3D dimensional perspective, uh, they're about the size of a golf ball. And that's quite obvious on the bottom of a water body. They're very big. They can be brownish or greenish, and they have a, a funk about them. They're a little stinky. So if you take them out of the water body, you'll definitely smell them. Um, this is a species that if you don't have it in the lake yet, we recommend that if it does pop in to pull them out so there are fewer and fewer to reproduce each year. Um, so harvest away. If you have any snails that are this big, um, just pull them out and toss them in the trash or in the woods far away from water so that they're not in there reproducing. They're easy to pick up. Uh, the zebra mussel we don't have yet. It is in Vermont and Massachusetts and parts of Canada. So there are threats. It's not in Maine yet um, and it's not in New Hampshire yet. This one is about the size of a pistachio nut for scale. And you can see the different colorations of shells, um, usually black or white, tan or brown banding on the shells, giving it that zebra like appearance. And then in that upper right photo, you can see those little hairs that are coming out of the shell. Those are actually sticky strands. So this one is gonna stick to surfaces, your boat hull, your uh, engine cooling water system, your black pipes into your lake. Uh, it'll be stuck to surfaces. 
So if you see any muscles that are sticking to things, that's definitely something worth noting. And then the last one that I'll point out, this is the spiny water flea. We don't have this one in New Hampshire yet, but it is in Lake George in New York and Lake Champlain in Vermont in New York. And they're tiny. So on the right-hand side, that's somebody's finger. They're holding up their finger. So you can see it with the naked eye, but they are still little. And then on the left-hand side, what you're looking at is a monofilament line, so a fishing line with a the end of a swivel over on the bottom left. So these will attach to fishing tackle and the individuals will be caught up in live wells, bait buckets, anything holding water and be moved that way between water bodies. So you probably won't see these in the lake, but you might see them attached to any lines or anything that might be in the water. And the problem with these is they have those sharp spines on them are actually glass. They're like glass icicles. They're made out of silica. And fish will eat these, but that glass-like material will get stuck in their digestive tract and the fish will get all full of glass and they will be stunted because they can't get their normal nutrition. So they are quite a concern where they are present. But again, they're not in New Hampshire yet. Um, so I threw a lot of things at you, and again, you'll have these resources at your ready um, to take a look at. But when in doubt, if you see something in Pine River Pond that is of concern at any point, just snap a couple pictures of it and email those to me, and I can take a look and let you know if it's something of a concern. If it's something that's cyanobacteria related, I'll get it to Amanda McQuaid and she can take a look at it or have somebody come and collect the specimen for microscopic ID, because we really need to get those algae samples underneath the microscope to be sure of what they are. So that's it for my slides. Um, you guys are welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions. I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, uh, this is Ken Cobb. I have a question. Um, this year, as you know, the lake is probably down a foot. I live in a cove, so the water is probably like about four feet from the, the, uh, the edge of the land. Is there any benefit or do you see any problems in the future because of this? So with the drought that we had last year and with the... <laughs> expanding drought of this year, what you could expect to see is as the lake level is down, that means that sunlight can penetrate deeper than it normally can. So you might have some expansion of your native plants into deeper, slightly deeper water, like a foot or two deeper out into the lake than normal. In terms of the area of the lake that's exposed right now, you might have some benefits of that if it, you know, dries out a little bit or it's not supporting plant growth. You may lose a season of seed production and you might have a thinning of plants in those areas. If those areas stay exposed for a long time, you might actually have some terrestrial growth encroaching on those areas just until the water level comes back up and then the terrestrial growth won't be able to survive. So you might see a couple things from the lake not filling completely. You guys are an easy group, no questions? All right, well, that was easy. Um, so I will follow up with Cindy. I will process the video recording and we'll put it out on our state YouTube page and I'll send Cindy a link of that. And then I'll send her the PDF of the slides that I shared with you tonight. So you have those as your own library of plant photos that you can take a look at. And do feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or see anything weird on the lake this summer. All right. Right. Everyone have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Right. This is very really useful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Oh. Thanks for the info. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.